How we doing, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Friday Ramblings. We are in March. March is the month of green, and that is why we are going to bust out a whole bevy of green and Celtic-influenced video ramblings for you. I got the green shirt. We're ready to rock, and we're going to start with a little something special. We're going to start with your quick little introduction and breakdown of the history of the Battletoads. Battletoads is perhaps the closest thing that we had for a brief few years there to a threat to the anthropomorphic fighting chaos of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yep. In the, in the 90s, there were a ton of contenders to the throne, but most of them generally stuck to cartoons and TV shows. Battletoads went full out, building itself off of a video game base at a time when the Ninja Turtles were still proving themselves as major contenders in the video game market, even though the cartoon had fully took hold. So, let's break down exactly what the Battletoads brought to the table. First things first, brief introduction to the characters. There are three Battletoads. They are named for some reason that I have never completely <laughs> thought was a great idea. After skin conditions of a unwanted nature. That's right. You have rash, zits, and pimple. Doesn't that just sound like people you want to hang out with? And of course, as the name Battletoads implies, they are toads. Nicely anthropomorphic, muscly, too cool for school, Battletoads. They are mentored by, the, by Professor T-Bird and rescue the beautiful Princess Angelica from the Dark Queen, who, much like Jessica Rabbit over on the movie sides, may have been just a little too attractive and a little too darkly seductive for the little children. Yeah, that's right, folks. The Dark Queen tended to wear leather and not exactly a whole lot of it. Your character seemed to be based off the very wickedest of your classic pinup girls. And don't get me wrong, she was certainly an evil character in her own right with the evil dialogue, but for a video game community that was still dealing with Nice, innocent females that needed rescuing, like Princess Peach Toadstool, or Princess Zelda of the Legend of Zelda. The Dark Queen busted onto the scene and definitely took a lot of notice. Amusingly, though, many gamers never actually got a chance to fight her because... The one thing that linked every single Battletoads game was notorious difficulty. The first game especially, which is the one most fondly remembered and the most iconic. So, let's get into the lists and a little bit of your statistics. The original Battletoads game was released in 1991 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. It was created by Rare distributed into Japan by Masa Masaya Games. In Europe and USA, the game was distributed by Trade West. It was a runaway success. The characters and mechanics quickly grabbing people's attentions as it was known not just for being a good fashion beat-em-up, but going full in on the cartoony aspect with your battle toads having their fists and feet uh, 
enlarge the feet going from barefoot toads to big old combat boots Boom! that would just kick enemies into the stratosphere and big fists would BAM pound them into the ground these would later become known by a few various fan terms including smash hits but they were definitely eye-catching ways to finish off a chain combo of attacks but as I said before the main thing that made the game infamous was the notorious difficulty and in classic extremely well made video game style this difficulty was very hard to overcome but at the same time done in a manner that encouraged you to keep trying it was never a difficulty where it felt like the game was impossible to beat but was simply a matter of just keep practicing memorize the turbo tunnel and learn to get those jumps down just right this may have been one of the first games to really break down players as they force themselves to be introduced to the concept of pixel perfect jump landing yeah before mario maker and those sadistic levels mario would have to jump at the exact right fraction of a second and if he was just a teeny teeny little single pixel off he wouldn't make the next platform Woo, Battletoads Turbo Tunnel it introduced people to that concept. And this was an official game, too. This wasn't even something made by fans who had already mastered the game and wanted to create something more difficult for themselves. Fact is, if you have mastered the NES Battletoads, even after all these decades, you are a small G god among big G gamers. Little G god, big G gamers. Because that's how we roll. Yep. A no cheats. One go round. No level skipping. Go through all the whole game. Because there are warp zones in the game if you know where to look. But like everything else in the game, they're extremely hard to utilize. A lot of times. But yeah, if you can go through the entire game with no cheats, glitch ex exploitations, or anything else to affect the difficulty curve... You deserve all the props in the world, and trust me, your video will get views. Nothing else, I will watch it, because I'm still impressed. I've never done it. And I have been playing this game since it came out in 91. You know, off and on. I never owned it, but my cousin owned it. We played it a lot at his house. You know, it's a thing. A lot of people have never beaten Battletoads. So, where did they go from there? Well, first, they ported this game to just about everything. It was ported by Mindscape to the Amiga in 1992 and the Amiga CD32 in 1994. By Arc System Works to the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis, depending on what region of the world you're in. And the Sega Game Gear, both in 1993 to the Game Boy in 1993 where it was fully titled Battletoads in Ragnarok's World. So, yeah, basically everything got it. Impressive. There was also a Tiger Electronics LCD game released in 1991 because it's Tiger Electronics. It was the early 90s. They LCD'd everything. And I mean everything. first real sequel came to the original Game Boy, also being titled simply Battle Toads. It was released in late 1991, which is why the later release port was fully titled Battle Toads in Ragnarok's World. Uh, the Game Boy game itself is not nearly as highly played Mostly because due to the fact that they recycled the title. Most folks didn't realize it wasn't a port. Especially when they got the later port. 
the Ragnarok's world, it's just kind of further muddied perception of things. Because you're like, oh, this sounds like a sequel, but this is a port. But wait, didn't they already port? Oh, so the game that sounded like it was a port was not the port. But the game that sounds like it was a new game is the port. And they're both on the same... Yeah, it... Bad marketing decisions, basically. Bad marketing decisions. But anyway, in the Game Boy version, in the Game Boy spinoff, you only can only have the choice for controlling Zit, and it is a single-player game, unlike the NES game, in which was two-player. Uh, Pimple and Princess Angelica both being kidnapped, as he was with her at the time. And maintains the difficulty of the original game. Some of the game's levels do resemble the original, but you know, it's a thing. It was also published by Trade West. And was released in Japan in 1994 by NCS. So, many years later. But, you know what? Those things happen sometimes. The game that most people think of as the sequel to Battletoads was the Super Nintendo Battletoads in Battle Maniacs, released in 1993. And later released in 94 for the Sega Master... Or, Developed in 94, but not released until late, late 96 for the Sega Master System. Well past the point where most people are still playing the Master System. I don't know why it wasn't ported to the Genesis. That was much more widely utilized in 96. This time it is Rash and Pimple who team up to save Zitz and the daughter of Psychone Industries... CEO from the returning Dark Queen. This game introduced the idea of each character having their own specific abilities and combos, with Pimple being the powerhouse, while Rash is the smaller and quicker fighter. The game is also quite difficult, but Maybe not quite as difficult as the NES. I mean, I've only played it a little bit here and there. Can't say I ever beat it, but it's a thing. Sold well, did well. It was never the icon the original one was. But again, very few things are. It was a hard legacy to live up to. We then got a spin-off pseudo-sequel, also released in 1993, as we had a Battletoads Double Dragon crossover game. Double Dragon series had had multiple entries on the NES, as well as a Super NES sequel in their own right. And in this game, their big major baddie, the Shadow Boss, teams up with the Dark Queen, and all five heroes band together to try to save the day. The first time in the series, the game offers players a full character selection screen. Uh, besides the Super Nintendo, the game also came out on the NES, Genesis, and Game Boy. Generally, I would say go with the SNES or Genesis version. As tends to be the case in these games released for uh, that many different platforms. Either one's good. Unfortunately, again, being released so quickly as with Battle Maniacs and the fact that Double Dragon was starting to kind of fade in popularity by this point due to some of the recent sequels and the live-action movie not helping the legacy much of the original few games. I mean, let's be honest, the original two Double Dragon games are some of the best beat-em-up games ever made. 
Double Dragon 3's got its positive points, but it's got a lot of criticism that's valid. Yeah, that live action movie didn't help anything though. It, it is beyond camp and yeah, it's it's worth seeing if you like really cheesy movies, but the fact that this was not meant to be a cheesy camp movie didn't really help. We'll go into more detail on that movie in the future. Maybe tag team it with the Super Mario Brothers movie. But anyway, it's a good game in its own right. It's interesting to be able to mix enemies from the two series together. But it still didn't quite achieve the awesomeness and purity of that original game. It felt more like we're just trudging along with what we've done before, this time in both series. Final entry in the classic series was an arcade game released in 1994, uh, referred to either as Battletoads Arcade or Super Battletoads. The arcade game brought to the table voiceovers, which was the first time it was used in these games, as well as an increased emphasis on the violence and in a couple cutscenes, the aforementioned wicked seductiveness of the Dark Queen. She was at her most vamp in this game. Plot-wise, it is pretty much the same thing we have seen before. It took inspiration from Battle Maniacs by having each of the characters have specific abilities and combos. However, this time you have all three Toads as selectable characters similar to the Battletoads Double Dragon setup. With Zitz being your intermediate balanced character. Like many of the earlier games, it is a mixture of platform beat-em-up and vehicle racing type games. Although this time, with that more focused on violence, the vehicle levels involve more about the combat at high speeds rather than memorizing various obstacles and avoiding the traps. After that, the Battletoads would kind of disappear into obscurity by and large for many years. Finally, as Rare was bought up by Xbox, we got various um, cameos. Battletoads appeared as a bonus boss encounter in the Xbox One and PC versions of Shovel Knight. Um, the original Battletoads and Battletoads Arcade are included in the Rare Replay compilation, which is 30 rare games released for the Xbox One in 2015 in one neat happy little package. Rush appears as a playable guest character in the third season of the Killer Instinct 2013 reboot, which is available on Xbox One and Windows. And Rash also appears as an action figure in the survival game Grounded, developed by Obsidian Entertainment and published by Xbox Game Studios. There was talk of a sequel being developed for the Game Boy Advance, but it was ultimately canceled. Finally, in 2020, we would get a new game in the series. Riding off the wave of nostalgia, redesigned games like Double Dragon Neon, uh, Contra 4, and of course the return of the classic Mega Man franchise with uh, 9 and 10, and eventually 11 since 9 and 10 did well. We would have the 2020 Battletoads. Built off the Unity engine and released for Microsoft Windows and Xbox One, the game was developed by Diala Studios with the assistance and supervision of Rare and acknowledges the 26 years that has passed since Battletoads Arcade, claiming that the Battletoads 
had been stuck in a fantasy simulator bunker for the past quarter of a century, finally emerging to discover that they are no longer remembered as great intergalactic heroes and in fact are barely remembered at all. Seeking to regain their reputation, they go to fight the Dark Queen, only to end up teaming up with her against a new alien empire threat. The game's graphical style is hand-drawn and has more of a cartoon-styled aesthetic rather than the, hey, we're trying to make this game look as real and highly detailed and cool-looking as possible with current video game hardware technology that you had in the original games. Yes, the violence was cartoony-based, but it didn't look like a Saturday morning cartoon. The reboot goes for that aesthetic. And, well, I don't mind that for certain games, Certainly something like an Earthworm Jim reboot would be excellent as a Saturday morning cartoon vibe. A lot of your old school fans did not like the new visuals. And while the game maintained a certain difficulty level reminiscent of the classic games, a lot of fans felt like that difficulty level was more about being difficult for the sake of being difficult and not for challenging players' skills in an honest and encouraging manner like the old games. The other big change to it is, we're going to have to go ahead and say this, the Dark Queen. When she returned in the 2020 reboot, she was radically redesigned not only to match the um, Saturday morning cartoon aesthetic but she was greatly desexualized wearing more of a gender neutral kind of outfit and again I'm not getting into the socio-political aspects of this I get it it's a different mindset um, especially with her not being the pure antagonist this time around wanting to kind of pull away from that wicked woman vibe but again this was one of those aesthetic decisions that hurt the game's sales and perception from the older generation fan base um due to the fact that we are older, we are psychologically comfortable with seeing women who are physically attractive and do not mind letting the world know they are aware they are physically attractive. Again, I'm making no moral judgments on any of this, either side of the debate one way or the other, but, but the Dark Queen her look was part of the iconic uniqueness of the original game. She had long since been, during that 25-year gap in games, made a lot of lists of, hey, classic female tag. You know, before Lara Croft, before Bayonetta, before we had... A lot more of Samus Aran cutscenes uh, before, during, and after the game, showing her outside of her armor. We had Dark Queen. You know, she was one of the original. Hey, there you go. Kind of things in video games, and I understand the younger generation. They don't necessarily want that. And it wouldn't have fit the cartoon aesthetic they were going for necessarily. But I think you could have had a more of a middle ground reached. It's like, okay, redesign the outfit, but still kind you know, I, I can understand that base idea, but I think that honestly they went a little too extreme in the one direction. It's like you had super sexualized dark queen of the classic series over here and you had modern reboot dark queen over here 
They should have met us right about here in the middle. I think everybody would have been happy with that. I mean, I certainly would have been. But, que sera, sera. Still, as I've said, honestly, if you can find a copy of the original Battletoads, play it. Get killed by it over and 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 over, and over again because it's still going to be fun. You may have to set the controller down and walk away a few times, but you will eventually just power through it by sheer force of will if you want to see beyond the first couple levels. Because I'm telling you, that turbo tunnel will challenge you. I don't care what kind of Twitch gamer you are. And by that, I mean Twitchy Reflexes, not the streaming media platform. I don't care what kind of reflexes you have from those bullet hell games. The Turbo Tunnel is a whole nother beast. Battle Maniacs is a wonderful sequel. Uh, the Battletoads Double Dragon, as I said, is a great crossover game. Still got the difficulty. Changes up the formula a little bit. Being an arcade game, it's harder to track down a legit copy of Super Battletoads. And I'm certainly never going to encourage anybody to do anything that is debatably legal. Because we don't do that things here. We are good people. We are nice people. I'm simply saying, if you can find a copy, how you interpret that statement is up to you. Still, it is March. They are lean, mean, green, and on the scene. And the Battletoads will keep on keeping on, at least in our memory and compilations, even if the reboot never gets a sequel due to the mixed reaction to it. Still, before we go off, I'm going to say, yes, let's go ahead and throw it out there. There was an attempt to make a Battletoads cartoon show. The pilot was aired as a Thanksgiving special in 19, I believe, 92. Do, 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 do. Let me check those notes. Let me check those notes. Got to check those notes. Check those notes. Where is my notes? Where is my notes? I have lost that note. That's not cool. Do, ba, do, ba, do. Uh, yep. Thanksgiving 1992. Released on, released on VHS in January 1994. Uh, the pilot was never picked up for a full series, however, despite Game Pro Magazine, among a couple others, claiming otherwise. The pilot has never been released on DVD, however, the company DHX Media, who own, now owns the Dick Cartoon Library, Dick Cartoon being the people that made it, like pretty much everything animated for American television in the early 90s, God bless you, Dick Cartoon. We will definitely give you a rambling of your own sometime in the near future. DH, as I was saying, DHX Media is the current owner of the Dick Cartoon Library, and they did release the Battletoads pilot on their official YouTube channel. So by all means, go check it out if you want to see what might have been. Yes, there has been a variety of Battletoads merchandise over the years as well. Still, they fell very short of the Ninja Turtles dominance of all things movies cartoon shows video games toys comic books but hey compared to things like street sharks and the cowboys and moo mesa and some of the other anthropomorphic challengers to the throne the battle toads carved their own legacy that has certainly withstood the test of time as the many, many demands for a sequel that was eventually granted in 2022 attest to. With that being said, though, we are done rambling for this week. We're going to see you back in seven days with some more St. Patrick-inspired stuff. That's right, we are not done yet. We have got stories of Celtic mythology. We have got Irish comic book heroes and one villain who did eventually rehabilitate, but shh, low spoilers here. 
And we've got a trip through our DC Golden Age JSA Legacy series that I love to throw at you every month with the hero that first showed the DC readers what the power of green is all about. And more importantly, his children, one of whom continued that legacy. If you know DC Comics, you know who I'm talking about. If not, well, you're just going to have to make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss that video and the other two I talked about when they go live. For now, I'm going to let you proceed through March. Stay green. Stay good. Keep an eye out for that pot of gold. Bye-bye, folks.